My name is Paul Ingram. I'm the Director of Growth Management at the Puget Sound Regional Council. And I have the great opportunity here to welcome you to um, one of our additional webinars in our Passport to 2044 series. Hope you're having a great morning. We know that many of you have questions about housing and the new GMA requirements. Um, and so we think this will be a very good topic to uh, cover today. Um, so I'm just going to, if my computer will go for it, um, just run through a few introductory comments before we get to our great uh, speakers. We know that this is a really important issue in the region, both when we talk to our policy boards made up of elected officials from around the region, and when we talk to members of the public, both through surveys and through other outreach events, um, housing, access to housing, housing affordability have all been identified as the top issues. Um, sometimes we talk about it being a crisis. Sometimes we just look at the numbers. When we did a housing needs assessment, we identified a need for about 800,000 housing units in the Puget Sound region over the 30 year period. Uh, the state's also been using the number about a million housing units needed statewide over the 20 year planning period. So like whichever number you want to use, um, the numbers are pretty big about needing a lot of housing and recognizing that a big chunk of that is needed needs to be affordable in order for the people in our communities and the people coming to our communities to have a place to live, to avoid the couch surfing or having to commute across multiple counties um, or all the other uh, impacts that we know our uh, families in our region face. So we know this is a really important topic. Um, we also know that 1220, House Bill 1220, changed GMA in a fundamental way and in some ways made our work more challenging. Um, but we also respect that the intent there is to really make our communities better and stronger. So um, we think this will be a great session. Um, we've heard many of you say, we want to know how to do this and questions about the differences between needs and targets and some of the different issues. Um, hopefully we'll answer some of your questions. Today's going to be a very dense discussion, uh, but we know you have, you, you have that interest in really wanting to understand this. So hopefully this helps a lot, despite its uh, denseness. Um, we are, I, I want to note that this is the 10th session in our Passport series. So if you're just joining us for the first time, we have a bunch of other ones. We actually did another one on housing um, and looking at racially disparate impacts back in October. We have links to those on our website. Uh, many of these have been in partnering with uh, Com Commerce and the Municipal Research Service Center. Um, so great resources both on our website and their websites as well. Today, um, after you, you get done with my short introduction, uh, we'll hear from Laura Hodgins at the Department of Commerce. She's been, just been doing amazing work talking about the 1220 requirements, um, the commerce guidance, and she's been going around to many different communities and forums uh, doing different presentations. So she'll have a lot of very detailed information to pass on. Uh, our housing expert, Laura Benjamin, will be um, also talking, and we've asked two cities to share the work that they've been doing so that it's not just kind of this theoretical, uh, these are the requirements or this is the regional policy, but um, Adam Weinstein from Kirkland and uh, staff from Palsbo, um, Heather and Nicole will be talking about their approaches, and hopefully that'll give you a sense as to what are some of the challenges they're facing and some of the approaches that, that they're working through. Um, I, there, I'm sure will be a lot of great questions that will come up. We might have a time for one or two as we go through the different presentations, but um, we want you to be thinking about a couple of great questions to ask at the end of the present at the end of the webinar. Um, our staff person, Liz Underwood Boltman, um, will be moderating the Q and A at the end. So we look forward to having a lot, a lot of great questions and a good discussion there. Um, I anticipate there will probably be more questions than we can get through in the time that we have, but put them in there, um, and that'll give us a chance to both try to address some of them today, and some of them might uh, we might be able to follow up with in the future, and um, and either or get back to you directly in some cases. 
Um, we do have at the very end, if you stay to the very end, we do have a, a Title VI survey that we'd like you to complete. So, so please uh, consider completing that. That helps us with our data recording. Um, we want to let you know, like I said, in some ways, just adding to your sense of being overwhelmed, we have a lot of resources. You don't have time to read everything, but we do want you to be aware that you can come to PSRC. Uh, we have things about the plan review and update process, things about Vision 2050, and a number of different guidance um, and informational tools on individual topics that you can access. So please go to our website. We have a lot of stuff there. And if you want some help identifying which tool might be um, most applicable to the thing that you're working on at, in any uh, given session or, or time period, uh, you reach out to us. Um, I do want to know that PSRC staff are in the process of reaching out to all the cities and the counties in the region right now, wanting to set up individual meetings with you to really find out what are the things you're focused on, what resources do you need, what ways can PSRC best support your plan update process. So if you haven't heard from us yet, you'll be hearing from us very soon. And with that, um, I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to turn it over to Laura Hodgson's from the Department of Commerce. Uh, Laura, glad to have you here this morning. And let me finish, stop sharing so that you can pull up your presentation. All right, thank you everyone for having me today. Can you see my screen, Paul? That looks great. All right, great. Well, today I'm here to talk to you about the other portion of House Bill 1220. Uh, the portion that we talked to you about in October was on the racially disparate impacts, which was the second portion of the House Bill 1220. Today we're here to talk about the planning for and accommodating housing needs. You're probably familiar with commerce via the lens of growth management planning, but we also wanted to let you know that we strengthen communities through just about every aspect of community and economic development. So today, as I mentioned, we'd like to briefly cover, go over the housing element requirements, what changed between uh, the last time communities did their comprehensive plan and this time, and then walk through the plan for and accommodate section, uh, which in, in my mind, we kind of group into the first section of the housing element update, which includes the housing needs and allocation, land capacity guidance, and adequate provisions. And then we'll follow up with next steps and for jurisdictions as they go through this work and our recommendations, as well as when you can expect the final guidance to be delivered. So House Bill 1220 was passed in 2021 in an attempt to better plan for housing in this housing crisis. It strengthened the goal of the GMA housing goal from encourage affordable housing to plan for and accommodate housing for all economic segments. It also updated the housing element requirements in the way shown on the screen. These include the requirement for commerce to provide projected housing needs by income bracket, including permanent supportive housing and emergency housing, and local governments to better plan for and accommodate housing of all incomes with the first three bullets, and address racially disparate impacts, displacement, and exclusion with the bottom three bullets. As I mentioned, the PSRC Housing Element webinar on October 26th covered the bottom three gray bullets here on racially disparate impacts, and today we'll focus on the top three. And generally, those top three bullets include the process that's outlined here. We have a lot of material to cover today, but if you think about it in these specific chunks of pieces, I think it'll help be uh, more digestible. And, and remember that with each of these steps, we've provided detailed guidance that will walk you through them uh, step by step so that if you're a little overwhelmed by the process, know that there's, there's clear guidance in our, our documentation that's out right now in terms of draft form and will be finalized in um, at the end of February, early March and in April. So these four main buckets of work under the housing needs work is for commerce to project the housing needs, which we're almost done with. Well, the final projected housing needs will come out at the end of February. Uh, those will include some minor updates from the numbers that are out right now. Um, and based on the information that we received from the Office of Financial Management and then updated projections for emergency housing. So the first step is for jurisdictions to work 
with each other, the counties and cities and towns to decide how to allocate or break up and divide up those housing needs that are coming at the countywide level. The next step is to show sufficient capacity for all of those housing needs in your local comprehensive plans and zoning regulations, and then identify barriers and limitations to meeting those housing needs. What is in your codes and policies is preventing that type of housing from being built in your community and come up with a plan of actions to address them and then update your policies and regulations. So we'll walk through each of these items here. Again, think of them as a kind of a sequential step and, and little buckets of work. So first, Commerce has been working hard at developing these projected housing needs numbers at the countywide level using OFM population projections as the base. Commerce is providing these at the countywide level because you know your land use and infrastructure capacity at the jurisdictions that you work in where transit and other services exist or are planned and where growth can be accommodated. Providing these numbers at the countywide level is also consistent with the GMA framework where OFM provides population projections at the county level. However, since this is the first time that communities will have to allocate housing needs by income bracket, Commerce has developed guidance for allocating these housing needs, including a tool to help communities divide up these housing needs by income bracket. So what does this guidance include that helps walk communities through this work of dividing up the housing needs. First, it includes uh, a description of how to use the tool, uh, our housing for all planning tool, to find the countywide housing need number. Basically, you select your county, you select your projection year, uh, the future periodic update year that you're planning for, and you input your how much you think the county will grow. And from there, it breaks down the projected housing needs, for the county into these income buckets as required by the statute. And it also set, so defines the emergency housing needs. The guidance also includes what we are calling our minimum standards for communities to allocate these housing needs. This is our understanding of how the, the statute has directed communities to implement and, and use these housing needs numbers that come from commerce. Basically, you need to use the numbers that come from commerce because that's what the statute says, but that also some minimum standards such as all of the housing needs that are divided up between the county and the cities need to add up to what's on the provided by commerce. In addition to these minimum standards, uh, we provide a description of the two methods that we've included for in the tool for jurisdictions to divide up these housing need numbers, and I'll go over that in a minute as well as guidance for how to develop your own custom process for dividing up the housing need numbers if you choose to use a different method. Uh, lastly, the, our allocation guidance includes some information about how do you match or align what you're finding from a, a, your local housing needs assessment process or your local housing action plan work with the numbers that are coming out from Commerce. The allocation tool itself, um, will provide two frameworks for allocating countywide housing need and may be used as is or as the starting place for discussions. The two frameworks for allocating housing needs are method A, which focuses on new growth. Uh, this basically says that the same shares of new housing growth are affordable in every jurisdiction. We like to say this is this method A is everyone does the same thing for the next 20 years. They they do the same uh, they try to plan for the same amount of affordable housing in their community based on their share of growth. Method B is focuses on the planning horizon year. In this allocation method, the same shares of total housing stock in 2044 are affordable in every jurisdiction. Basically, everyone tries to reach the same goal. There are other allocation options that jurisdictions may use. They can take the information from our tool either method A or method B and do manual adjustments to the values provided so long as they meet those minimum requirements, or they can incorporate new criteria and weight them based on how important those factors are to come up with a custom allocation. So that's the allocation piece. I know a lot of communities are already well underway in that work and we've spoken to a lot of you on that and we are excited that you are so far in that work. While you start, while you make those decisions on your allocation, we recommend that you start to think about this next piece of work, which is the land capacity work. 
And this is then once you get your numbers from the allocation process from your countywide process, this is the next piece of the work. And that is to make sure that you have enough land capacity for all the housing needs within your jurisdiction. This time the land capacity must include consideration of new factors that are bolded here on the screen. We have developed guidance for communities to walk through and do this land capacity analysis, which builds off of the information and the processes you've used in the past and the information you've currently developed with your available lands work. So we want to build off of the work that you've currently done and take those next few steps that are, that are new in the statute to help better meet the housing needs in your community. So over these next few slides, we'll go over the steps for doing this land capacity analysis in light of these new changes. The process for determining land capacity for all incomes is shown in the graphic on the right-hand side. It's a six-step process that generally includes documenting the allocated housing needs in the comprehensive plan housing element that you get from your countywide process, relating each type of housing need by income to the zones in your community that can reasonably accommodate those housing needs, and then showing that there's sufficient capacity to meet the housing need based on those relations that you that you made in your land capacity assumptions. Under the GMA, jurisdictions must adopt and implement any necessary changes to achieve land capacity to accommodate all their housing needs by the comprehensive plan periodic update. Therefore, we recommend communities start to look at what land capacity they have based on these relationships of zoning type to affordability level now so that they can help to scope what changes they might need to, to think about and discuss with their communities and evaluate for their comprehensive plan update. So now we'll walk through these six steps. Again, it builds off of the work that communities already do through their current existing land capacity work. The first step is that jurisdictions should compile a summary of the development capacity information for each zone and for accessory dwelling units. We've included a brief overview of the process for determining a jurisdiction's land capacity in the House Bill 1220 land capacity guidance, but it builds off of the framework that communities currently do from the or urban guidebook uh, that's on our website. Although capacity for ADs is not typically considered in buildable land studies, we have, we have included it in this land capacity methodology because the housing element calls for jurisdictions to consider the role of ADUs in meeting housing needs. ADUs have the potential to also meet the lower income housing needs within established residential neighborhoods. And because of the focus of addressing affordability, we feel this is very important. So we've provided guidance on how to reasonably estimate how many ADUs could be built to meet your housing needs. And the steps generally follow this, this four-step process where you estimate the total lots eligible. For example, if you have a large area where um, either there's an HOA that does not allow jurisdictions or the setbacks are so large and the lots are so small that they wouldn't allow ADUs, those would not be eligible. And and would be removed from the, the base lots that would be able to accommodate an ADU. Then you estimate the rate, potential rate of production, look at how many ADUs have been generally been developed in your community over the past few years, and assume those trends are consistent moving forward or improve based on regulations you've, you've developed in your jurisdiction. Then check if there, um, is if you have the actual capacity in your jurisdiction based on the total lots eligible. For example, if you have more lots eligible than, um, than your, uh, sorry, if you have more production than you have lots eligible, then you'll need to, to check that here. And then this is the step where you can also add in a deduction factor based on how many, how much uptake you think your IDUs will have in your jurisdiction. And then you can account for the number of ADUs per lot that you currently allow. So once you develop that base analysis of how much capacity you have in each of the zones, the next step uh, will facilitate relating each of these zone categories um, to potential affordability levels in step three. So jurisdictions should identify which housing types are allowed in each zone as shown in the left table here. 
Uh, the simplest approach is to classify zones into three or four zone categories based on the housing types and density levels that are allowed. Based on the characteristics in your city, you can use, or in your jurisdiction, you can de determine how many of these zone categories to use. We imagine most jurisdictions will divide up or classify each of their zones into three or four of these zone categories. Then after you identify appropriate zone categories for your jurisdiction based on this table on the left, the next step is to associate each residential land use zone in the jurisdiction with a specific zone category. So you'll take your, for example, your R4, your R8, your R12 zone and figure out which zone category is most appropriate based on the housing types allowed and the density in the jurisdiction. And the table on the right provides an example of how, how you might do that for four different land use zones in your jurisdiction. When summarizing housing types that are allowed in each land use zone, Commerce recommends using focusing on housing types that are permitted by right and considering the predominant housing type in the zone. For example, if historic trends show that home builders are almost exclusively building detached single family units in medium density R8 zone, then it would be most appropriate here to classify it as low density for the needs of, of evaluating capacity to meet the housing needs in your community. The next step is to then equate those zone categories with affordability level. And in this step, it's the kind of the key piece of taking the current land capacity work that you, you've done up to this point and applying that 1220 lens where you're looking at affordability to make sure that we're make there's zoning within your community that meets the affordability needs of your community. So in this step, based on local market conditions, we're trying to answer the following questions. Which income levels are likely to be served by the new market rate housing production in each zone category? And in which zone categories is it feasible for affordable housing developers to produce new income qualified housing and permanent supportive housing, assuming typical sources of funding and financing available? Assuming answering these questions requires an analysis of local housing market conditions and housing affordability levels, as well as outreach to local affordable housing developers. This table provides an example of how the findings of this analysis can be summarized based on typical market conditions in many parts of Washington, although this may be a little different in high cost areas of the Puget Sound region. The final column here summarizes a direct relationship between the zone category that we developed in the previous step and the assumed affordability level of housing that can be achieved in that zone category and in those specific zones. Our guidance includes two example tables that can be used as starting points or as base assumptions if you're not able to do more detailed analysis in your jurisdiction. One table we've included is for moderate cost jurisdictions and that's this table. We've also included a table for higher cost jurisdictions um, because we recognize that the assumptions and what can be achievable, what is affordable based on the density levels in a jurisdiction is a little bit different in higher cost areas. So the next step, thankfully, is an easier one. Uh, this step is to summarize land capacity for housing unit production by zone. This table provides a simple example that builds off of the land use zones and zone categories shown in the previous slide. Basically, we're just summing up the capacity into these buckets of zone categories that we've determined in previous steps. Then the next step is to uh, take the jurisdiction's projected housing needs by income level and compare those to the capacity that we've determined in the previous step. The allocated housing need column here, column two, shows the jurisdiction's allocation of need by income group, as well as for permanent support of housing. These needs are aggregated or totaled up to the zone categories. And then the rightmost category column here simply compares the capacity that we've determined in previous steps with the housing need. And it determines if there's a surplus or a deficit of capacity in each zone category. So when total projected housing needs, in this case, 24,000 are compared to total capacity for housing growth, 27,000, this analysis shows a surplus capacity of 3,000 units. However, when capacity for each zone is compared to housing need at the associated income levels, this analysis shows a significant deficit 
to serve households at 80% of AMI or below and a significant surplus of units in the low density category. This indicates that there's not enough land appropriately zoned to meet the housing needs in this jurisdiction based on what type of affordability level can come out of certain zone categories and certain zoning in your jurisdiction. So based on this finding, a jurisdiction would need to do additional work to show they can provide capacity to meet housing needs and document the necessary actions in the housing element. And I think this kind of boils down to the fact that we've, most of the, a, a large portion of zoning in jurisdictions does not yield the type of housing that's affordable to those under, earning under 100% aid or immediate income in our jurisdictions. And now to make sure that they have that type of housing available to them in the future, um, we need to better zone more appropriately for those housing needs. So what would this look like in terms of a jurisdiction having to then make these changes? If a jurisdiction shows that they have a deficit, they'll need to then show, make changes to their, their policies and their regulations to show that they don't have a deficit for those affordability levels moving forward. On the reverse, if there's no lack of capacity for any income bracket, the jurisdiction is, is done and they've shown that they have sufficient land capacity. But in the case of the example that we've have been walking through in this slide, a jurisdiction might need to make changes to the regulations. And this could be accomplished by rezoning selected developable lands to higher densities. For example, changing a portion of single family residential, for example, R4 to multifamily, or by amending existing zones to allow greater density, for example, changing the moderate density residential zone from eight units per acre to 12 units per acre. This table here illustrates an example of rezoning adjustments to address the deficit in the previous example. In this example, a jurisdiction chose to implement an incremental approach to increasing zoning capacity across zones, gradually increasing densities with the most density focused around its transit corridors. So more density was added around its transit corridors and then the density in adjacent zones was gradually increased um, or, or decreased to the, the single family uh, low density zones in their jurisdiction. Or on the other hand, some of those low density jurisdictions were the edges were gradually increased in density um, so that you could then uh, add more density around the transit corridors and the areas with more services. Overall, this incremental approach addresses the deficit that we've seen in the previous slides. So that's the land capacity approach. Again, it builds on the work that communities have already done. Uh, there is a new lens to land capacity uh, from that uh, comes with 1220, and that is based on the new requirement to now plan for emergency housing. Um, before we get into this approach to making sure you have enough land capacity for emergency housing, um, we did want to remind jurisdictions that there are new requirements for allowing the siting of emergency housing in jurisdictions, and that cities may not prohibit indoor emergency housing in any zone where hotels are allowed, or they must allow emergency housing and shelters in majority of zones within one mile proximity of transit. So cities must do that framework there, but they may adopt reasonable occupancy spacing and intensity of use requirements, so long as they don't, those requirements, the spacing requirements, for example, do not prohibit a community's ability to allow enough emergency housing to meet their needs. In light of these requirements, and in the light of the way that we've developed our emerging housing projections and our permanent and our housing projections by income level, we have developed the following uh, framework for um, determining if a jurisdiction needs to do a land capacity analysis for emergency housing. And this is largely based on those new sections of 1220. So if a jurisdiction, um, sorry, let me set back, a jurisdiction must do a quantitative analysis for land capacity for emergency housing unless they can demonstrate that they've met these other requirements that are, are previously determined in 1220. So if a jurisdiction has one or more zones that allow hotels or they allow emergency housing by right in a majority of zones with a one mile transit and there are no regulations that limit occupancy, spacing, or intensity, 
a jurisdiction doesn't have to do a land capacity analysis for emergency housing. If one of these is not true, then they will need to do a land capacity analysis for emergency housing. And this is specifically in response to those other sections of 1220 that I talked about on the previous slide, which said you must have enough capacity if you have these, these conditions in place. So how do you go about doing an emergency housing land capacity analysis? We walk you through the steps. I'm not gonna go over it in much detail today, but you basically look at where you can allow emergency housing. You take out properties that are, um, you look for those that are vacant and can actually accommodate emergency housing in the future, re remove pending development applications, apply those any spacing requirements you have. For example, if you allow, if, if emergency housing can only be accommodated every 1,000 feet, then you use that 1,000 foot uh, buffer to determine how many sites in your jurisdiction can allow emergency housing, determine how much emergency housing you can allow on each of those sites. And we have some guidance on how to do that and determine if that meets your needs. So if, for example, since we walked through an example of the income housing needs and the land capacity, we want to show you a quick example of what that might look like from emergency housing. In this case, based on the spacing requirements and the intensity requirements that this example jurisdiction has in place, they have about five acres of available land that can accommodate emergency housing because they're vacant, they allow emergency housing, um, and they allow emergency housing. However, when you look at how many housing units for emergency housing that can accommodate based on the table we've provided in our guidance, there's still a deficit in emergency housing. So in this case of jurisdiction, we need to go back and revise the spacing or intensity requirements to allow more sites to be available. And in the bottom table, they, with those revisions, they allow slightly more land is available based on reduced, either reduced spacing requirements, intensity requirements, or by allowing more zones to have the ability to have emergency housing and they address the deficit and can show that they have sufficient land capacity for emergency housing. So I know that's a lot of work and we still have a little bit more to go, but we wanted to kind of boil it down to what we think communities are gonna find um, and remind you that there's a process to go through in our guidance and you can walk through those six steps to go through that work to determine if you have capacity. In some though, we think jurisdictions will probably find that they don't have enough capacity for lower income housing needs. And this will result in a need to add more zoning capacity for higher density housing types. Also areas that were not planned to be served by infrastructure or don't have it yet, may need attention in the capital facilities plan to support the needed capacities um, of, of lower income housing or any housing in your community. We also understand under the Growth Management Act that rural areas are, are not ideal to support lower income housing needs because the lot sizes result in higher prices, because if you live in a rural area, there isn't as much transit and therefore you have to own a car. Um, and because under the GMA, there are not many housing types that are allowed in rural areas. Therefore, we recommend that growth be directed to cities and incorporated urban growth areas, and if it's appropriate, landlords that have infrastructure. And also, uh, communities will need to take those steps as noted in 1220 to allow emergency housing and shelters, transitional housing, and permanent supportive housing. And that's sections three and four of 1220. And while those were required to be done in September of 2021, we expect that many jurisdictions will update the regulations with this periodic update. So that's bucket two of, of the, the, the projected housing needs work. Um, thankfully, this, this third bucket on adequate provisions is a little bit simpler um, in terms of uh, complexity. It walk, we walk you through a checklist of how to do this work. Um, and I'll go through it quickly and then I'll transition to the next speaker because I realize this is a lot to, to swallow. So previously, um, section D of the housing element, make adequate provisions for existing and projected housing needs of all economic segments of the community was just that. It was just that line you see here in orange. In 1220, they added the items that you see in gray here, 
which say you must take into consideration items one, three, and four, and that you must also do item two, which is to document programs and actions needed to achieve housing and availability. We'll walk through these briefly. Again, items one, three, and four are items that you should be looking at as you review your policies and regulations. Step two requires a little bit more action, so we'll walk through that one in a little bit more detail. And for item one, thankfully, jurisdiction will already have done this work, uh, incorporating consideration of low, very low, extremely low and moderate income households by doing work we've already talked about. So by documenting their share of local housing needs and their housing element, as noted in the allocation guidance, and by identifying sufficient land capacity for all housing needs by income bracket, as noted in the land capacity section, number one is already done. So check that one off the books, off the list, and we'll move on to number two. Number two is kind of the, the big portion of, of this piece, and, it, and the, the legislature asks jurisdictions to look at the barriers that are preventing housing in a community. So we recommend communities work through this three-step process where they review their production trends to determine if there's any barriers to housing in their community. If so, then they gather information to determine what kind of barriers exist and then look at what changes they need to make, um, what actions and programs are needed to overcome and identify those identified barriers. These steps are meant to be conducted for each housing type and affordability level. And we provide steps and checklists on how to go about reviewing the barriers and questions to ask developers to determine what barriers exist, as well as recommendations for what type of actions can address the barriers you're seeing in your community. So the first step is to review production trends and see if there are if you're not meeting your needs in any of either the income brackets or the housing types in your community. You can do this based on looking at past trends of the amount of housing that's been developed in your community. In this case, based on historical trends, there a community is not meeting its lower income housing needs or its moderate density housing needs as shown here on this slide. Then based on this information, we provide uh, tables to walk through what are the barriers that may be contributing to these this lack of housing in your community. So we recognize that the barriers to housing production will vary by community and that they could be a combination of different factors, whether those are development regulations, process obstacles, limited land availability, or environmental constraints and gaps in local funding. So within each of these, we walk through what might be barriers and, and ask jurisdictions to evaluate if those are the barriers, and if so, what actions might be needed to address those options. We recognize that um, the lower income housing needs and communities will, funding will be a barrier. We recognize that communities will not be able to achieve this house, the lower income housing needs without funding, um, and therefore, while we recognize that a large portion of this, this funding will likely need to come from the state and federal government, there are tools within the control of local governments to uh, participate in, in meeting those housing needs. And we recommend that jurisdictions complete uh, a checklist for local option tools for addressing affordability, affordable housing gaps in their community. We don't have that slide here, but just keep that in mind that we do recognize that a large portion of the, the funding will need to come from the states, but there are actions that local governments can um, look at and evaluate as barriers. Then once you identify those barriers, you can determine what actions might be needed to uh, achieve, um, correct those barriers or to overcome those barriers. And we provided a list of strategies to help you identify where you might want to look to address those barriers in your community. The next two steps of make adequate provisions are to evaluate where employment locations are in consideration and look in response to uh, where jobs are located. So we ask communities to consider where jobs are in their community, where transit is in their community, and where housing is, and to think about focusing housing locations in 
those in proximity to jobs, as well as those in proximity to transit, which can get you to jobs. So that's this section here. And then make adequate provisions also ask jurisdictions to look at where to, where how accessory dwelling units can start to meet the housing needs of within their jurisdiction. For this step, we recommend jurisdictions look at the existing conditions, how well are ADUs being received in your community? Are you seeing a lot, seeing a lot of production? Or are they and are they being used for residences? Based on that information, we also recommend doing an ADU barriers and actions review. That was part of uh, the steps previously mentioned, and then talking about the, where the potential role of ADUs can be in meeting future housing needs. We realize that's a lot, so we wanted to kind of pause here. Um, remind you that this again, this work is kind of the three buckets of work where we work on allocation at the beginning, um, land capacity, and then identifying those barriers and actions to addressing your housing needs. And we walk through each of these again in each of our, our guidance pieces, um, but kind of think of it as three buckets. And as you do so, um, we wanted to just kind of wrap up with our project. Schedule. We've, we've presented to here um, out for public review. Our last piece is out for public comment right now, the adequate provisions piece. So uh, we encourage you to take a look at that and provide comments by uh, February 24th. Then our projected housing needs and final allocation guidance will come out at the end of February, followed by the final version of our land capacity and adequate provisions guidance that uh, will incorporate comments that we've received to date. Uh, we're currently working through the land capacity comments and we'll do the same for the adequate provisions comments that we get. Following that, we'll have two webinars. We realize that we've thrown a lot at you today. So we wanna take some time and step back and walk through it in a little bit more detail and in more bite-sized chunks so that um, it's not quite so overwhelming. So please keep an eye out for those webinars that will take place in March and the end of April. And with that, I unfortunately don't think there's time for questions at the moment, but I would like to, um, with Liz's approval, transition to Adam. Actually, I think we've got we've got a number of questions that have come in, so we might just like work through a oh, couple sure. of these now um, and just to make sure we're um, kind of able to get through everything later, hopefully. Um, so yeah, that was great. Uh, lots of really good questions coming in. Please feel free to keep submitting comments, but or questions, but um, maybe just a couple for you right now. So uh, Laura, if the land capacity analysis shows a deficit, do we need to show both analysis in the comprehensive plan or just the post-regulation change version? Um, your comprehensive plan would need to show a land use map that uh, that would allow the types of densities. And then it's our understanding that the, the, the regulations that accompany those that land use map would also need to be adopted by the end of the periodic update. Uh, and that comes from section 3670A115, um, uh, which says you have to have the land capacity and development regulations. We realize that that's a big lift. So if you have trouble with walking through the timeline of that work, let us know and we'll, we can work with you on that. Great. Um, how did Commerce develop the emergency housing numbers and their allocations? Good question. So we went through a long process of working with providers um, and experts who work in the field of emergency housing to really hear what is the best data available out there. We had um, focus groups throughout the state listening to what data is about out there and, and what are the needs on the ground. And based on the best available data sources, which are homeless management information services and a suite of information um, developed by the research development arm of the Department of Social and Health Services. We use base information from them and from those two documents and trends in what may contribute to homelessness in the future to develop those projections. And those are currently being developed right now based on our methodology. And I will today be posting an abbreviated version of that methodology, kind of a cliff notes version of how we develop those numbers. But basically we use best available information and trends to determine what those will be. Great. 
uh, maybe just one or two more. Um, so what is the expectation that these new housing units are actually going to be available for long-term rental or sale versus used as short-term rentals? Uh, do jurisdictions have to address this? It's something to take into consideration when you um, are looking at your, uh, when you are planning for your housing needs. For example, if you are in a community that has a lot of short-term rentals, we do recommend that you potentially look at increasing the allocation share because there will be a portion, if that's the case in your jurisdiction, you have a lot of short-term rentals, there will be, not all of those will be available to full-time residents. And what we are planning for and that the housing needs is just full-time residents. So um, we do recommend you take that into consideration. If you are a jurisdiction that has um, a lot of short-term rentals, Alternatively, if you don't want to increase your housing need numbers because in, you're in, a, in that situation, then we would recommend looking at short-term rental or second home um, uh, regulations that might um, help to control for that, um, that extra housing need in your community. Great. Uh, well, we've got a number of other questions that have come in. I think it just in the interest of time, uh, we'll save some of those for later, but really want to thank you, Laura, for your presentation. And I think maybe we will queue up Adam now to talk about Kirkland. Thanks, Liz. Hey, everybody. Good morning. I'm Adam Weinstein, the Director of Planning and Building at the City of Kirkland. And I will just share my uh, PowerPoint right now, which I'm always really bad at. Here it is. Hopefully you can see my first slide, um, but yeah, really happy to be here to tell the story of missing middle housing in Kirkland. Um, we actually have three years of implementation under our belt, um, and it's work that we're really proud of, work that our staff and planning commission and city council did a couple of years ago without any you know, GMA requirements or other state regulations. It was something that they did unilaterally because they wanted to increase housing choice in our community. So really happy to be here. Um, you know, missing middle housing in Kirkland was less about regulated affordable housing and a lot more about diminishing housing affordability over time um, where you know our parents live in big mansions and our kids or grandkids live in a little tent. Um, the headline on the right I think says it all. Looking for a starter house, good luck. Um, there's just nothing available um, in terms of how to, housing affordability um, for starter homes um, in Kirkland or other east side communities or many other communities across the state. Um, and that's what our regulations um, and our amendments were trying to address. So here's the problem statement. If you look at the um, far right-hand column in this chart on this slide, it shows that if you're making the median income in Kirkland of about $100,000 for a household of three, you can afford a $400,000 house. Um, and I don't know if anybody wants to guess um, how many $400,000 houses are, there are for sale in Kirkland right now. I'm a little bit of a, a Redfin addict, and so I, uh, I I checked last night, and there was one two-bedroom condo for less than four hundred thousand dollars for sale in Kirkland right now, and then a couple of um, one-bedroom or studio units, um, and no no houses, um, no standalone houses, certainly no duplexes, no triplexes. So in terms of how we formulated our missing middle housing regulations, um, we spent a lot of time here in Kirkland on the policy and not actually a lot of time on the regulations. So the city adopted a housing strategy plan back in 2018 that encompassed a couple year process with a community advisory group, um, tons of public input. And that housing strategy plan adopted in 2018 identified a lot of actions um, ranging from lobbying for um, condo liability law to be reformed to building more transit oriented de development to just building more compact compact housing in our single family neighborhoods. Um, and so this is the this is the action in our housing strategy plan that we use to launch amendments to our zoning code to tackle missing middle housing and we worked on and got the missing middle housing code amendments adopted and adopted in about a year. And this image right here just illustrates the four flavors of missing middle housing that we have in Kirkland. We've got um, cottages outlined in purple. Those are units that are less than 1,700 square feet in size. Um, duplexes and uh, triplexes, which are self-explanatory. And then ADUs as well, um, which we feel like is a, a significant part of um, our missing middle, middle housing strategy as well, um, as Laura mentioned in the last presentation too. 
So we built our new missing middle housing regulations based on old missing middle housing regulations that were adopted back in 2005. Um, those were decent regulations at the time, but they were very restrictive and they didn't end up generating a lot of new units in our community. So um, we approached the new amendments um, around 2019 or so with the underlying premise of treating missing middle housing like single family housing and peeling away the barriers to building missing middle housing. So basically what that means is that if you can build a 4,000 square foot house on a single family lot, we wanted to make it possible to build a couple of compact, more compact housing units within that same building footprint, um, adhering to the same setback and height and lot coverage requirements as single family, but just allowing for more units to be built. And so what that means is that um, under our new regulations, which are shown in the column on the right, you can build two missing middle housing units um, where you could normally build one single family house. And you can do that in all single family residential zones across the city. And you just have to come in for a building permit. You don't have to, you don't have to come in for a special discretionary review uh, of the project. And the parking requirements are also slashed pretty significantly from what they were before. Generally speaking, in most of Kirkland, if you're building a cottage or a duplex or a triplex, you have to build one parking space per unit, ADUs. Um, no parking spaces. All right, and let's see, I'm having trouble advancing the slide. Let me see, oh, there it is, sorry. Um, the one thing I wanted to mention on this slide, again, this is just comparing the old, the old regulations to the new ones. Um, new regulations, we allowed accessory dwelling units to be built as part of cottages or duplexes or triplexes. And so what that means is that in a place where you could normally build just one single family unit, you can now build two, a duplex, so two units, and then each of those duplex units can have one accessory dwelling unit. So you actually get a fourplex out of that where, again, before you could only build a duplex. Um, so that was a, a pretty significant change in our uh, regulations. Another thing I wanted to mention is that um, when we were working on our missing middle housing regulations, we were also looking at sort of our natural uh, missing middle housing capacity, our medium and high density residential zones, which weren't really the subject of our missing middle housing code amendments. Um, and what we were finding was that folks, developers were building um, single family housing in zoning districts that were really intended to provide for much higher density housing. And so when we adopted the missing middle housing regulations that really tackled housing in our single family neighborhoods, we also established density minimums in our medium and high density residential zones. So that, those would actually be built out at higher densities. Um, so you have to build at 80% of the maximum uh, density in those zones. And we've had some success, I think, there. Um, slashed regulations and barriers to develop, developing ADUs as well. Um, again, lots of provisions here that I won't go into in a lot of detail. But um, generally, we allow two accessory dwelling units per lot. Generally speaking, no parking required for either of the units. Um, the the uh, developer who is ever building them can sell them independently, so they can be for sale. There's no owner occupancy requirements. Again, we really tried to peel off all of the barriers to develop ADUs in, um, in Kirkland. All right, and then um, this is something that we're tracking really closely. We're really trying to look at how effective our regulations are. Um, it can be a very academic exercise, I think, to create missing middle housing regulations. And we're really, yeah, wondering about how, how well they're performing so that we can make amendments in the future. Um, you know, I think what this um, chart shows, this shows the production of missing middle housing, um, the issuance of permits for missing middle housing over the years from 2017 to 2022. We adopted our new missing middle housing regulations in 2020. You can see there was kind of a weird dip there. Um, we adopted our regulations in March of 2020 when this big worldwide, worldwide pandemic happened with all of its attendant supply chain issues. But we're really seeing issue permits climbing back pretty steadily after 2020. And so um, again, a lot of work to do, I think, on our missing middle housing program. But our production of total missing middle housing units um, has about doubled um, since 2018 and 2019, um, we think in large part to the, the regulation change. So just to wrap up with the last couple of slides, um, what are we seeing out in the community after adoption of these new regulations? 
we're seeing um, a lot of examples of uh, a, a single family lot being acquired, what was once a single family lot being acquired, and then a small primary, uh, primary residence being constructed with two accessory dwelling units in the back, and then all of those being sold off independently. We're seeing a lot of two packs of cottages um, being built on infill sites throughout the community, like these two here, which are just a couple blocks north or a block or two north of where I'm sitting right now. Um, again, a, another you know small small batch of cottage developments. This one um, less with neo traditional architectural features and more with modern neo traditional features, which our code now allows. And then I um, just wanted to say make a couple of remarks about price point um, for these units, which I know is a, of a lot of a lot of interest right now. Um, the Cottage that I showed in the last slide um, were up for sale for about a million and a half dollars. Um, and I know there can be a lot of hand wringing around that. That is a lot of money. It's more than our expected price point for cottages. Um, what I would note is that across the street from this cottage, there is a single family house for sale, recently built single family house for sale that was on sale for three and a half million dollars. So while you know a million and a half dollar uh, cottages are not really what our code is um, intending, they're half the price or less of um, standard single family houses that, that are being built for sale right now in Kirkland. I should mention too, this condo here, or sorry, this cottage here actually sold for more like $1.2 million. Um, the single family house across the street sold for about $3.2 million. And just to wrap up the presentation with some takeaways from our experience, um, again, we spent a couple of years on the citywide policy, but we, we conducted and got the, uh, the code amendments approved in about a year. Um, we have a very pro housing council. We have um, left of center council members, um, centrist council members and a libertarian, um, but they were all united um, in support of these missing middle housing regulations. Um, next, we didn't ever say that we were dismantling single family zoning in Kirkland. This, these code amendments were really about imposing an overlay district in our what were once known as single family districts to allow for more housing choice in those areas. Um, got lots of interest in cottages, um, increasing interest in accessory dwelling units, um, not as much interest in duplexes and triplexes, but our um, pre submittal uh, data shows that that might be changing. There is some more interest in duplexes and triplexes. Um, and then again, you know, this is not affordable housing right now, um, and the new units come with a lot of uh, with a high price tag, which I think means we need to do a better job um, increasing the supply of these units. I think once the supply increases, the prices will moderate. Um, and then last but not least, um, missing middle housing for Kirkland is just a sm small piece of our overall housing strategy. Um, we have lots of other policies and regulations that tackle things like walkable communities and transit oriented development and actual affordable housing. Um, and so with that, again, thanks for having me and I'll pass it over to Laura Benjamin from PSRC. Great, thank you, Adam. Go ahead and start sharing my screen. So my name is Laura Benjamin. I am a principal planner at PSRC. Hopefully folks can see that. So I am going to share some information, specifically regional guidance and res uh, resources for developing a housing element, including a local housing needs assessment. Just a quick overview. So always have to start out with our regional framework, remind folks what's in Vision 2050 and our regional housing strategy. Um, also share some information, specifically our regional housing needs assessment and how that can support the development of a local housing needs assessment some additional resources and guidance, and then wanted to touch on a few points around the plan review and certification process when it comes to housing elements. So first with the regional framework, um, for folks who tuned into the first housing webinar we had last year, this may look familiar, but you know, so important, so foundational in that Vision 2050 really informs our plan review and certification process. Um, so when we worked with PSRC boards and committees to update Vision 2050, we heard loud and clear from folks that housing was a key issue, um, you know, how we can address housing access and affordability across the region. And the multi-county planning policies were updated accordingly and really center around kind of these three themes, 
First, it's that housing is a regional issue. We see housing access and affordability um, challenges in all communities, no longer just a big city issue. Um, and that while there's some shared challenges, there's also differences. So solutions as to how to address housing access and affordability may look different community to, to community. We also um, really focus and vision that housing is not in a vacuum, that it's tied to transportation, access to jobs and job centers, um, the economy and just overall quality of life. So, you know, housing is part of our communities. It's not just, you know, structures that we build for, for people to live in. And then the third, you know, really tied also to our regional growth strategy is that um, jobs housing balance is a really key issue. So where we build housing, where we have job centers, how we connect those, and where people can afford and have choices to live is really important. Also, I just want to quickly touch that Vision 2050 directed PSRC to develop a regional housing strategy, including a regional housing needs assessment. Um, our executive board adopted the strategy back in February of 2022, and we've now been busy uh, implementing the strategy, a lot of that in preparation to support um, comp plan updates. So just really quickly, the strategy is centered around key three, three key themes supply, stability, and subsidy. So supply, uh, supply really that we need more housing of different types. So not only do we need more overall, but we need more diversity in the types of homes we provide for residents. Stability is looking at how we can provide opportunities for residents to live in housing that meets their needs. So making sure that housing is, um, you know, has services if it needs to, that it's in the right kinds of locations and communities, it's at the right price point, and that as communities grow, change, investment comes in, um, that residents have the ability to continue to live in these communities. And then third is subsidy, so looking at how we create and sustain long-term funding to create and preserve um, housing for very low income and unhoused residents. So we know that for um, sometimes even moderate, but mainly for low and very low income residents, the private market, you know, those homes just don't pencil out and it requires, you know, direct funding, subsidy, some kind of public intervention or incentive so really thinking about how we can better leverage what's in the books and how we can get more on the books. So this here, the image on the left is a snapshot of the housing checklist in the plan review manual. Um, this is specifically for um, housing in local comprehensive plans. You can see there's a link to the plan review manual um, at the top of the slide. I should note there's links to many of these resources in the slide deck and the slide deck will be shared after um, today's webinar. So really encourage folks to kind of look back at the materials and the video and you can kind of dig deeper into that. And my contact information is at the end of the presentation as well. But so here we have housing for the plan review manual. So at their first housing session last year, we focused on kind of this bottom session, a section, the addressing inequities and in access to housing. So really, this is the part of the um, checklist we're focusing on today, how to assess housing needs, how to increase housing supply and choices, and how to support the development and preservation of affordable housing. So now diving into some regional data, can um, share some resources and kind of some high level examples of how it could be used. So hopefully for folks who have attended some of these webinars, community profiles is a, a, um, sounds familiar at this point. This is a really great resource. Um, the URL is at the bottom of this slide. Since um, Adam from Kirkland just presented, I chose Kirkland as the example. Um, so this provides a variety of data by jurisdiction. Um, wanted to just really focus on what we have for housing. So, um, you know, you can uh, select your community on the left side. You can then click on the little housing icon up at the top. And you can see there's information on housing units, home value, rent, home ownership. Um, you can also see there's some kind of basic demographics on the left as well. Really, really great starting point. All of this, um, most of this data is coming from the census. We also have had some early conversations about adding potentially a few measures to the uh, housing section to support some of the racially disparate impacts on um, requirements in state law. So more to come on that. This is a good reminder if you aren't already to sign up for the comp plan newsletter, because um, if and when we update these community profiles, that's definitely something we'll include in the comp plan newsletter. Another resource for regional data is the 2022 Regional Housing Needs Assessment. And this is exciting because this is the first true regional housing needs assessment PSRC has um, developed. 
Um, this was not a, you know, we have housing data, we have for um, several years, but this was not something we had as part of the 2015 and 2016 comprehensive plan updates. So really excited for that. Um, it was developed as part of the regional housing strategy. Um, I will say it, in most cases, does not have data at the local jurisdiction level. So, um, you know, the community, the community profile, some of the guidance commerce has, you know, really is focused on what is specific for, you know, a, a local jurisdiction. What this provides is data, obviously, at the regional level, a lot of it's broken down at the county level. And then also at some, you know, more specific geographies, like um, regional geographies that are tied to the regional growth strategy. We look um, for some data measures specifically at regional growth centers and in high capacity transit station areas. And then also several of the data measures are broken into sub areas, which are two to three market sheds per county. So really trying to, um, you know, kind of dig into the nuance we heard from staff that oftentimes data rolled up at the county level can kind of wash over some of those differences in subregions. So looking at these sub areas kind of helps to understand um, a jurisdiction in uh, relation to its neighbors. So really what we see the regional housing needs assessment as being a value to local housing needs assessment is that it complements the local work and can provide a point of comparison. And I'll share just a few examples on that. So first, just a little bit about some of the need numbers that are in the regional housing needs assessment, I um, want to be really clear that these are tied to Vision 2050 and have um, a horizon year of 2050, so different than 2044 for folks planning in the central Puget Sound region. Um, generally, I would say these numbers are consistent with what's coming from Commerce and tied to the 1220 work, but um, I'd say talk to Laura when it comes to housing need. These, again, are just kind of illustrating some larger pictures and consistent with that. So first is that we know we need more housing now. So this chart is looking at the ratio of population growth to housing production by decade. So when we see a higher ratio, those numbers down at the bottom, um, that means we had you know, less housing being built in relation to population growth. So for instance, in the 2010s, you know, when we know we were still in recovery from the Great Recession, that for about every three people moving to the region, only one housing unit was being built. So we see um, in the 2020s, there's a shift there that we have, you know, it's about 1.68, which is more in line with what we want to see. Um, but the, so we see there's this uptick, but there's still a backlog and more units are needed now. Also looking to the future, we know that we need a lot more housing units to accommodate future growth. So between 2020 and 2050, we estimate the region needs about 800,000 additional housing units to accommodate future growth. You can see that kind of uh, the estimates broken out by county consistent with the regional growth strategy. And we also know that a lot of these units need to be affordable to moderate and lower income households, that there needs to be some level of subsidy, public intervention, something um, so these units can pencil to be priced um, to um, be affordable to lower and moderate income households. So you can see here we estimate about 34% of uh, new uh, units will need to be affordable to households earning less than 80% AMI. So now diving into some of the examples we have of how we've kind of spliced and diced some of this data that might be unique and helps kind of complement and provide a point of comparison um, for local housing needs assessments. So this example is showing units in structure by regional geography by county. So overall, the takeaway here is that greater housing diversity is needed in all types of places across the region. But for instance, you know, an, um, an example is say you're a core city in King County. So that could be the city of Tukwila and you understand what your breakout is of single family versus moderate density versus high density units in your city. And you could compare that and see that, you know, how does your city compare to other core cities in the county or is the region overall? So again, kind of a nice point of comparison there. Another example of this here is looking at um, rents specifically in regionally designated regional growth centers, as well as a subset of high capacity transit station areas. And we see that rent costs more um, in these places compared to kind of the regional or, or county averages in most places which you know, in most cases makes sense that you know, in these areas that are better connected to transit, jobs and services, um, kind of the demand and the market's ability to ask for more rent is there. 
So you can see kind of a breakout there and some call outs there. So, um, you know, if you were looking at wanting to look at a specific area versus the city as a whole, we have some data on that that could be helpful there. And then one other example of how we've spliced and diced data that could be helpful. So these are the sub areas. Um, I will say we have maps and much more methodology that's really kind of specifically understand, you know, what jurisdictions, which census tracts fall into these kind of names. I understand the names on the screen right now might not be super intuitive. Um, but so this example is showing jobs housing balance by sub area. So say for example, um, you are looking in Southwest Snohomish, perhaps you're the town of Woodway, looking at jobs housing balance. And you could say, well, you know, you know what's going on within your town, but then you could also look and see what's happening in the Southwest Snohomish sub area versus Snohomish County as a whole and kind of see some of those comparisons and where perhaps there are gaps or um, differences as well. So now moving on to resources and guidance we have to support housing elements. First is the updated housing element guide. Um, again, this may look familiar for folks who attended the housing session last year when we had a draft updated housing element guide. It is now finalized. It is on our website and available at the link at the bottom of the screen. Um, so we had a housing element guide back in 2015 and 2016. So we have updated it to incorporate um, you know, the planning framework in Vision 2050 and the regional housing strategy that I talked about at the beginning of this presentation, also highlighting kind of new and updated um, data sources like some of what we just talked about as well as some other PSRC data sources. Um, also incorporates, its, incorporates the updated state law that Laura um, at Commerce has talked so wonderfully about over several sessions. And then also ties us all to the plan review checklist. So I really encourage folks to take a look at that. Um, also has some really nice kind of helping to connect the dots between if you have these types of needs in your communities, these are potential policies that uh, to look into as well. So kind of how to take those steps for moving from what you learn in your housing needs assessment to actually what's in um, the housing element. Um, so that is available for folks to look at. Other things I wanted to highlight, um, we have what we call our housing incentives and tools survey or the HITS. So this is a survey PSRC fields to local jurisdictions to really understand, you know, what do local jurisdictions have on the books in terms of promoting housing development and specifically to the development of affordable housing and how is it working? So we fielded the survey back in 2010 and we did it in 2019. And we did it again in 2022. Thank you to local staff on this call who filled out those uh, surveys. I know that there um, can be a little unwieldy. So really appreciate you taking the time to fill those out. Um, so we will have a full report available in just a few weeks. Excited about that. And we'll share that and a link to that when it's available. Um, but it looks at a variety of, of things, including like, you know, local tools and incentives, who's adopted what, what changes have been made, you know, units produced based on that. Um, what local jurisdictions are doing around tenant protections, um, as well as displacement, displacement mitigation, and then also hearing about local revenue sources. So we see this as being a really um, super resource because it's sharing real world examples. It's not just conceptual best practices or, you know, we heard that in Boston, this works really well. This is actually hearing from your neighbor jurisdictions, you know, jurisdictions across the region as to what works or if they had lessons learned, you know, they tried something. It didn't really hit the mark. This is why um, a lot that can be learned there to help inform local plans. And then one more resource. Again, this may look familiar from the earlier housing presentations. Um, the Housing Innovation Programs, or HIP, just want to highlight this. So it's a collection of 49 planning resources to help promote housing affordability and smart growth. Um, there's a link at the bottom of this page. Um, there's 49 tools, which I know is a lot. So we have um, a dynamic search function. You can kind of say, you know, this is my need or this is my community's goal. Search that way and it'll kind of um, bring up certain things. And these can be a nice starting point to um, decide if this is something to include as a policy in your comp plan and then could also help further with implementation down the road. So now moving into plan review and what all these housing resources and things mean for plan review. So just wanted to quickly um, share, um, PSRC staff have had a few conversations with our growth management policy board about um, plan review and certification and specifically housing. 
Um, some things we've heard from our board about why housing is important for plan review and certification is that you know housing access and affordability is a regional priority. You know, kind of circling back to what I said at the beginning of the presentation about when we updated Vision 2050, we heard from stakeholders across the region that housing was a priority for for uh, Vision 2050, and you know that sentiment is being carried uh, carried forward now as part of the plan review process. Also similar to what we heard with vision and that's captured in vision is that every community has a role to play. So, you know, in all comprehensive plans, we wanna see communities, you know, understanding the need around housing access affordability and how to move forward in, in addressing that. Um, and that also, you know, as we said before, housing doesn't happen in a vacuum. It's tied to transportation and job access, quality of life. We know there are systemic inequities that, um, are, are perpetuated by some of our housing as well. So really realizing that what's in a housing element and what the aspects of housing in a comprehensive plan are tied to, to other aspects of the plan as well, and planning as well. So in terms of what PSRC reviews when it comes to housing, it is limited to comprehensive plans. So PSRC does not review zoning regulations, develop regulations, you know, funding or funding applications, or construction. It's really what's in the plan. Um, so we focus at this point on planning, not so much on performance. In 20 for the 2015-2016 update, um, we had a more focused um, review of housing elements and additional resources. So you know, this is the first time we had PSRC's housing element guide, provided detailed housing comments. Um, also, you know, provided support and review of housing growth targets. So that is something we are continuing on with, you know, we have the updated housing element guide. We plan to um, provide detailed comments and work with uh, local staff being really proactive about that, um, having some of those conversations now. So looking forward to talking to local staff. And then we also got direction from our growth management policy board to make sure that the updated state law, specifically what was in House Bill 1220 from 2021, that that's incorporated into the review as well. So um, the plan review checklist on housing for local comprehensive plans, um, we made a few minor edits to it at the board's direction to incorporate state law. I will say the updates that were made are all consistent with vision. A lot of it was just kind of, you know, being a bit more um, specific or making sure that provisions in 1220 are reflected in that checklist. So another thing we wanted to touch base about is housing need, a housing growth target, and then capacity. So this is a question that comes up pretty regularly. There's a lot going on here. Um, we're always happy to continue talking with folks about this um, offline and that they're all related, but they're also specific and separate things. So first, for housing needs, so this is, you know, the number that's going to come for commerce at the countywide level, and then the countywide planning groups are going to create some kind of process to um, allocate those numbers at the local jurisdiction level. So that's what we say when we're talking about housing need. Then the housing target, so these are the growth targets for the 20-year expectation. So for jurisdictions in the Central Puget Sound region, that's out to the year 2044. And this is what's through, um, consistent throughout the plan. So infrastructure and investments, you know, when you're doing transportation demand modeling, when you're looking at capital facilities, things like that, these growth targets are what's being put into that, those analysis, those assumptions, and are consistent throughout the plan. And then capacity is really what can be built under the zoning code. So capacity needs to be enough to at least accommodate the growth target at a minimum, but you'll see on the next slide that, you know, there's some wiggle room there. So now what does Vision 2050 say, trying to get into this a little bit more. So really what's driving all of this at the highest level is that it's really, really important for us to coordinate our planning for the distribution of regional growth. You know, we know from pre-GMA that things just kind of happening um, doesn't really kind of move us towards our goal of improving quality of life for all people. So that we need to be coordinated about where and how much growth is happening across the region. So what does vision say specifically? Is that a comprehensive plan needs to demonstrate substantial consistency with the adopted countywide growth targets. So you can go back to that previous slide as a reminder of what the growth target is. 
but that we know additional capacity, you know, that's how much housing can be built under the zoning code may be needed to achieve growth targets and also to, you know, meet the, the, the requirements of what Laura was just talking about in terms of accommodating housing at those lower income bands. But the capacity, the capacity number, that's not what's being put into a transportation demand model. That's not what's informing, um, you know, infrastructure or other capital, uh, capital facilities. That's the growth target. So we realized that there, you know, you may need to revisit capacity to look at how to accommodate your growth target as well as how to meet um, capacity for housing at different types and different income levels. But that doesn't mean that the total amount of growth should change. Again, I realize this is confusing. We are happy to talk offline. I know at least in the central Puget Sound region, um, growth management staff are setting up one-on-ones with local staff and are happy to dive into this more. I just wanted to point out the graphic on the right. This is just a capture um, from the regional growth strategy section of the plan review manual and the checklist specific for local comprehensive plans. And you can see, you know, some of those bullets are then in this checklist. So, you know, a way for a local staff to be kind of checking off what's happening there and to identify where in the plan that these are um, being met. So with that, that's my contact information. Again, I'm um, always happy to chat offline. I will pause and touch base with Liz and that Liz, I think we may have time for a question or two, but I will leave it up to you to decide that. Um, I think we've got, so we've got a number of questions kind of still waiting in the queue. So I think maybe we can just move on and uh, hear from City of Baltimore staff and then answer the rest of them collectively as a group. Great, thank you. Well, with that then, I am pleased to hand it over to Heather Wright and Nicole Coleman from the City of Baltimore. Thank you, Laura, for providing an overview of PSRC's resources and guidance available. The theme of this top selling Dr. Seuss book has mirrored the city of Paulsville's experience with implementing our housing action plan. For where we started and thought we were going and where we have ended up are not quite the same and our journey is not over. Thank you for the opportunity to share the city of Paulsville's experience implementing our housing work. My name is Heather Wright. I'm the planning and economic development director for the city of Paulsville. And presenting with me today is Senior Planner Extraordinaire Nicole Coleman. Thanks, Heather. Um, one of the things I'll start with is a little bit of background in um, our housing work that we've been doing. Uh, we obtained, we're one of the first jurisdictions to apply for and obtain a housing action plan grant. Um, we were about to get under contract in early 2020. And as we all know, everything got delayed for a while. And so we adopted our housing action plan by resolution in uh, December of 2021. And around the same time, we saw the call for the HAPPY grant. Um, and so we submitted an application for that um, with some ideas about how what, what we might want to do. Um, and one of the notes we will make later on is that don't be afraid to amend your grant. Um, we, we submitted our application, we amended our potential projects when we were, went under contract, and then we've since amended it one time again. And so um, it's just a way to move forward and find the best path for spending that money. If you're not familiar with Polsbo, um, we are located in Kitsap County um, and uh, we have multiple ferries that come our way. We've heard from a lot of new developers in the area that uh, have never been here or spent time here that it's kind of the new frontier of the Puget Sound, which is um, exciting but also scary for people who've been here for a while or even new people. Um, we are 12,000, just over 12,000 people as of our 2021 uh, number, and we are just over four square miles. So we are a small, compact city um, that does um, growth management really well, I think. Um, and 60% of our housing is in single family residential, um, single family homes. Uh, we've recently had an influx of apartment units, which has been great because for 20 years, we didn't have a single apartment unit be built. Um, and so we've had quite a few in the last few years. Um, and our code allows for missing middle product, um, and, but it's, you know, there's those barriers to developing it. And then we just haven't seen it um, come to fruition here in Polsville. 
So, um, which is an important element of our housing action plan is that um, looking at our cost burden population and the housing needs and 30% of our owners, homeowners and 70% uh, 70 70 of our renters are considered cost burden. So. so when we initially submitted our housing action plan implementation grant, we you know took some items from our action, we took some action items from our HAP um, and thought, okay, here's some low hanging fruit that we can work on, which we thought was some low hanging fruit. Um, and then we were also trying to be strategic about what we could do in house, um, especially when it comes to development regulations. Um, we know our code and our city best. And so going out and having someone else do that work doesn't always make sense. And so we initially submitted some of these items. Um, and Heather will walk you through one or two of them. Um, but we were really trying to have the most impact with the funds that we had, which was really limited. Um, we wanted to kind of get the most bang for the buck. Um, and so we pivoted a number of times um, and Heather will kind of walk you through that. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, we started with what we thought would be a no brainer for our community. One of our neighboring jurisdictions had just adopted this program Two other cities had multiple years administering this program, and plus we had some information from Commerce on the effectiveness of this program in actually producing multifamily and affordable units. So we embarked on the adoption of the multifamily tax exemption program. We thought the hardest decision might be which program to adopt, the 8, the 12, or the 20, and if where we wanted to limit that program to. What actually came out of the other end was that our commission was very interested in the tax shift of the program. Um, we were actually asked to pull up a project that had been approved in 2019 and relate to the commission what the financial tax shift would be to each of our Palsbo residents. Um, I understand from Commerce's guidance that this isn't a choice of the assessor of how the multifamily tax program is administered. And for our assessors, the um, reduction in costs that are received from the tax assessor are shifted into the residents and it actually occurs across the entire state. And so what we found was for a 91 unit apartment building that was constructed in 2019, if they had used the MFT program and 12 of the units were affordable, or excuse me, 18 units were affordable under the 12 year program and 73 were market rate, the tax shift that would be felt by our residents was $14.39 a year, not a really large amount, but it was concerning enough to our commission because there was some uncertainty as to just how many programs would participate in this. And it was decided after looking at that and also considering just the impact it would have on staff to administer the program. Um, our team is small and mighty. We have five total, and we don't have anyone specifically dedicated to housing. And the, the cost and burden of administering was also concerning to our commission. So at the end of the day, they actually recommended for us to not adopt the program. And we decided then to shift our efforts onto another action identified in our housing action plan. The city of Paulsville has the benefit of having an active and engaged religious community. We began discussions with our faith leaders about this religious property density bonus. Um, within Paulsville, we have 10 properties that represent 44 acres total. If you're not familiar with RCW 3678-545, it was passed in 2019. We've done a white paper on it to look at all the jurisdictions that have adopted this program. And what it does is it gives municipalities flexibility to incentivize the affordable housing development projects according to their own specific needs. The law does not specify the amount of a density bonus nor in which zones the bonus should be made available. After conversations with MRSC and our city attorney, we determined that this bonus may not be a great fit for the city of Paulsville. It doesn't actually allow for you to, to maintain the right to build market rate, which our properties already currently allowed. And it may even therefore preclude or limit the ability for the affordable units to actually be actualized. So it was a lengthy process to realize we're gonna put this on hold and we're going to bring this program back up again as we move forward some of our other missing middle initiatives. 
So in summer of 2022, um, I mean, all of us who are in the comp plan planning process right now due in 2024 uh, received notice that we would be getting additional um, grant funding to help with the comp plan update. And so that was 75,000 for the city of Polsbo for um, the first year and then 75 the second year, I think that's the number. Um, but that more than doubled our budget for a comp plan update. So that should tell you a lot about what our budget was to begin with. And so um, to us, this is you know a windfall of funds and um, for a small city like us, very frugal city like Polsbo, um, we had the opportunity to kind of sit in a room and brainstorm how we wanted to best leverage these funds and spend it in a way that was best for our community and for our staff. Um, and so um, it allowed us to kind of think outside the box in terms of how we want to use our, what we still had was our happy funds, and then now we have our comp plan funds. So this is the last amendment we made to our happy grant application. Um, we are working, we're a high, high capacity transit community. Um, it is not realized, but it is a label that we have. Um, and so we were thinking about our SR305 corridor, which connects Polsbo from Highway 3 and then south to Bremerton to the Bainbridge Ferry, and then also you can get to the Kingston Ferry via uh, SR305. And so we were looking at it as a transit-oriented mixed-use area, um, and how can we increase housing supply along that corridor with access to services, grocery stores, you know, transit, all the things that planners talk about. Um, but we really, as most of you on the the call today No, we also we have our population allocation we have our employment allocation and so we were thinking okay could we increase housing in our commercial zones um, but what does that do to our employment numbers and we we didn't want to just throw darts at the board and hope that it works out in the end so um, we worked with commerce um, with their grant staff uh, Catherine and Laura they were really great um, when I first proposed using the happy grant funds for a market analysis, a commercial market analysis, they were hesitant as they should be. Um, but then we walked them through the intent of the project and ultimately um, we have a good amount of funding now towards the market analysis for the 305 corridor through our happy grant application funds. So, um, and we're excited to find those, get those results that's underway and we have our consultants going and we should have some information in the next month or two. So if I could fast forward to today and focus forward and echo the slide from Laura that focused on the housing needs and targets. In December, Kitsap County directors pivoted our attention to the affordable target due to the passage of House Bill 1220. That as Paul Ingram stated earlier and Laura has demonstrated has changed GMA in a fundamental way. We have found that housing need numbers that were derived from running commerce's allocation to tools described by Laura don't completely match what our housing needs assessment has indicated were our needs for both the city of Polsbo and some of our neighboring communities. I could give an example. We have one affluent city whose housing plan has indicated it needs more market rate homes to actually bring down the cost of housing in their jurisdiction. But one of the method, method B from Commerce shows that none of this jurisdiction's target should go towards the construction of market rate homes and that this community should actually make efforts potentially to convert that market rate to some affordable. While Commerce provides examples of how this could be accomplished and their guidance for making adequate provisions draft that was released in January, there are some practical challenges to this actually being implemented. Additionally, what we were planning for based on our housing action plan and what we may now need to plan for depending on House Bill 1220 could substantially change our approach to amending our code to demonstrate that we have the capacity for all incomes. So until we have our affordable target, we have chosen to halt some of our missing middle efforts to make sure there's the sufficient capacity to meet the housing allocation through appropriate zoning changes. And for those of us that are watching the legislature closely, we know that House Bill 1110 and other legislation that's moving through Olympia right now could radically change some of our requirements and much of what is being could result in changes to our code that may be superseded by new legislation. So we're learning lessons from other jurisdictions. We're focusing on our target and we're letting draft regulations simmer while we wait to see what comes out of this year's legislative session. Um, and to, I think, summarize a little bit what, what Heather just said is that we had 
um, a lengthy work plan for 2023 to work on um, development regulations to increase um, access, the ability for developers to build missing metal housing. Um, and we were excited about it. We were looking forward to the work. We, we felt like it was important work and good work. Um, but as she mentioned, we have put that all on hold because um, we continue to get more comprehensive plan work that we didn't expect. Um, we're nervous about whether or not we're going to have additional climate change requirements coming around too. So um, we basically kind of said, okay, we're just going to put it on hold. So it's an interesting, um, you know, we have this staff that wants to do the work. The city is kind of ready for it, but now the unintended consequences of the legislature continuing to add on additional things is that we can't do that work that you wanted us to do two years ago, three years ago now, because we're working on stuff and doing now. So um, it's just, it's frustrating, but you know, we're doing our best and just kind of putting everything up for a second. Um, so some summaries of what we chatted about um, is don't be afraid to amend your grant and think outside the box. Um, I really appreciate Commerce's staff working with us and always willing to answer questions. Um, they've been really good and really great to work with on our grant applications in terms of us trying to go a little bit, you know, different pathway. Um, leverage your dollars. Um, for a small jurisdiction or a jurisdiction doesn't have a lot of funds for comprehensive planning or long range planning. Um, we really, we sat in a room for two and a half hours and mapped out our funding and what we could spend money on and what we could do in house and what we needed outside help with. Um, and that gave us the ability, which um, in order, that gave us the ability to realize that we could keep our um, previous planning director on staff, Carla, who's on the call, I think. Um, we were able to keep her on staff to help us with the comp plan, certain elements of the comp plan, such as the capital facility planning, which is a whole body of work in itself, so that I can focus on the housing side of things without having that ability to keep her on staff um, through the grants that we're receiving. I don't know if we could get all this work done. Um, again, think outside the box. Don't be afraid to pivot. Um, just, I think a good lesson that Heather talked about with the MFT and the religious properties is that um, it can be frustrating when a project that you were thought was kind of low hanging fruit comes to a halt. Um, but what we realized is that we learned so much through those processes that we had no idea about when we got started. So now we're much more informed about those two programs for when we bring them back in the future, which we intend to at some point. Um, so in the end, we learned a lot that will help inform future um, amendments. And that is all for polls, Bob. And I can pass it off to Liz for Q&A. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, we've got some uh, existing questions in the Q&A, but please feel free to add some more as you um, think of them. So um, I'm going to loop back around to I think some questions that came up uh, during uh, Laura H's presentation, but um, there may be a couple that we can sort of combine here together that um, maybe both the Laura's might want to weigh in on and potentially others. Um, so uh, how should we how should counties and cities reconcile their adopted 2044? Um, how Housing targets with these new numbers, um, and then kind of a, the, a related question is: um, Are housing number, are housing needs by income when aggregated required to match housing target numbers? So I'll take a stab at that one. Um, Laura, correct me if I'm speaking anything wrong about PSRC. Um, in my mind, the way I see it is: is the state's requirements for housing needs are your base. Uh, PSRC has already determined their vision targets. Uh, which may be uh, above that or or the same as that. I don't think in any case they're, they're lower than that. Um, so what we recommend doing is inputting your housing targets from Vision 2050 or what you have adopted to be consistent with Vision 2050 into the tool and using that to develop your housing needs and it will be consistent with commerce and consistent with vision. Yeah, so just to add on to what Laura said, I um, just want to thank Commerce staff, Laura included, um, that when the um, tool was being developed, one of the comments we had was we're like, where do housing, you know, existing adopted um, housing growth targets factor into that. So um, the current round of the tool does have a way for the user to go in, input that, and it kind of helps to kind of collate all those numbers. Um, and that's something that I think either PSRC or Commerce staff can help with if folks have more questions. Yes, I'm happy to answer questions and we're actively working with each of the counties on that process right now. So if you have more specific questions, reach out to me. Great. 
Uh, Laura H, a uh, question about um, funding for planning work. So in addition to the funding Commerce um, has given to cities already, is there any additional funding that um, the amount of housing work, uh, I, I think basically just sort of like, is there additional funding um, sort of expected to, in terms of uh, providing, uh, supporting housing work? Yeah, good question. Um, I mean, there's a lot of funding on the plate right now. There's the uh, periodic update funding, the, which the other half will be available in July. Um, so that was split into two um, because of the way the bienniums were structured. Uh, we also have the happy grant funding, which is available now, and the middle housing grant funding. So we, we have a lot of funding out for housing right now that can all contribute towards this work, depending on how you scope it. As Paul's both said, um, we, we allow flexibility in how jurisdictions propose to use those funds, and we recommend the use of them at to the best advantage of, of how they see fit based on their specific needs. Um, the legislature may appropriate um, more funds and next year, especially with the focus on housing. So I think it's still be it's still to be seen how that shakes out in terms of, of future housing, but there's currently some health funding on the table right now. Uh, great. Um, so another sort of state level question um, and sort of speculative, I think, at this point, but um, are there any housing bills in Olympia under consideration this session that would affect House Bill 1220 re uh, requirements that you described or the schedule for compliance with House Bill 1220? There are no bills that are scheduled to change the compliance with the timeline compliance for 1220 and a periodic update timeline. Um, there's one bill, 5609, which uh, has some overlapping requirements with um, 1220 in that it uh, asks jurisdictions to evaluate what are the barriers to housing being um, uh, permitted and allowed in their jurisdiction and also looking at uh, commerce developing under production numbers, which in a way are already included in our um, projected housing needs numbers. So that's the, the main bill that overlaps. There are there some other bills that will um, encourage the use of ADUs and encourage or or more um, strong-handedly uh, require um, middle housing. Uh, we can't really speak to any of those yet because things are still haven't even passed out of committee yet. So um, unfortunately, we can't speak to those. But the main one to look at is 56 and 9 in terms of overlapping requirements. Great. Um... I think another kind of like band of questions for uh, for Laura. Um, so in terms of looking at I think barriers to um, housing, do you want do you want to distinguish between financing and land based subsidies and incentives? Um, and then another comment about um, that uh, producing ADUs is a financial barrier. So trying to understand kind of like how to document of uh, barriers that you might be experiencing um, uh, to uh, achieving capacity. Yeah. So we we've kind of. Um identified uh, financing and, and those uh, other land-based subsidies and subsidies barriers, um, primarily the financing part, but we, in our to, in our checklist to evaluate what the barriers are to housing, we provide a framework for jurisdictions to start that review, but it's by no means binding. We, we recommend that you look at anything that you think from your perspective, you guys have the best understanding of what the barriers are to housing in your jurisdiction and note what those are and then try to come up with strategies to address them. So we don't need to be limiting, but we do provide some ideas in there. Great. Um, so maybe we'll mix things up and ask um, Adam from Kirkland a question. Um, uh, how has Kirkland addressed development costs uh, in middle housing development? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, it's hard for us to tackle at, at a city level, obviously, right? We don't have control over, um, you know, supply chain issues and um, and uh, the cost of lumber and things like that. But we are we have streamlined our permitting process. So again, instead, if you're coming in for a missing middle housing permit, you don't have to go through a discretionary review. In the old days, um, you come in with a cottage permit application, and um, one of our staff would review it. They would write a staff report. It would go to me for approval. Um, and then we would approve it. And then you'd have to come in for your building permits. So we tossed that process out completely. And folks just have to come in for building permit um, applications, which really streamlines the process and reduces development costs. We're also pursuing things like um, pre-approved um, ADU plans. So, you know, ADU plans that are already pre-approved um, from a building code perspective, we can purchase them um, easily and cheaply from an architect and then um, 
come in for a building permit. That should also reduce development costs. Great. Um, and a question that maybe um, multiple folks could uh, could answer: uh, Will high income communities with large regional state infrastructure investments or high capacity transit communities be required to provide middle housing and affordable housing accessible to transit? How will they be held accountable if they don't follow commerce guidance? So, well, not every community will be allocated a portion of their housing needs uh, from the countywide level. Every county will have income housing needs at every income bracket. So they will include low income housing, they will include extremely low income housing, they will include moderate income housing that will need to be potentially addressed with middle housing. They will also include emergency housing for the first time ever. And, and that's something we'll need to tackle. Um, to adequately address that and in commerce's understanding, and again, we are not the, the gatekeepers of the GMA, we provide guidance. Our interpretation of the guidance uh, at this, of the statute in terms of providing guidance is that communities will need to have the zoning the, and the policies that allow that housing to be affordable to those housing needs that they have in the community and enough housing to be affordable at those levels, as well as uh, starting to review what barriers there are to preventing that housing to be built in the first place and coming up with a plan to address it over the, the next few years. Yeah, and I guess I'd also add just in terms of the regional perspective, um, our uh, regional growth strategy and the countywide targets really focus growth in jurisdictions that have um, existing or planned access to high capacity transit. We also have a regional goal about growth um, in center, regional growth centers and near transit. So uh, I think that we've got a lot of policy support that really encourages local governments to be um, trying to uh, support more of that growth uh, near transit, as well as addressing uh, the affordability needs that you would need to that make those um, equitable communities. I'd also like to add on to that, that when uh, we do plan for all housing needs that we plan for them, uh, particularly those that are um, for households that are in the lower income brackets, that we plan for those in appropriate areas and plan for those housing types in areas where they have transit and services so that they can uh, get to those uh, because they may not have the means to have a car and it provides them access to services um, where they may not otherwise have access to them. Great. Um, we'll do maybe a Laura B question next. Um, so when was PSRC certification um, revised to include housing? Yeah, so you always have to get this question. So um, the state law and the adopted policy framework that guide um, certification is the same as it was for the 2015-2016 process. Um, just to back up in terms of plan review, that is really kind of a staff level process. We obviously, it's informed by Vision 2050 and the feedback we get from our board, um, but that's, you know, PSRC staff working with local staff and providing comments and uh, recommendations on the full plan, both in terms of um, components of the plan that are tied to certification and components that are not. Certification is a board decision. Um, and that, that our policy boards and ultimately PSRC's executive board take action to um, certify conditionally or not certify a plan. So ultimately that decision is up to our elected officials who represent the region. Um, the, you know, kind of the direction I presented in my uh, presentation is what we've heard from discussion from policy board members, but it has not been um, formally adopted. And maybe I'll just add on that our um, housing, our, our plan review checklist has always included housing related items. So uh, we've always sort of provided a uh, comment on um, housing issues as part of our uh, plan review process. So um, just an extension of kind of what, what, what we've always done too. Um, okay, so maybe back to Alora H question. Um, I think this is a, the first question here is referring to um, emergency housing. So a question is sort of what is meant by spacing, I think between emergency housing. Yeah, so what is meant by spacing is some jurisdictions, when they allow emergency housing or emergency shelters in their jurisdiction, they say they must be spaced uh, 1,000 feet from each other, or they must be spaced more than 500 feet from a elementary school or playground or a library or something like that. That's what we mean by spacing. They basically limit where they can go based on certain distance requirements. And those distance requirements mean limited ability to 
have land to meet those needs. So you have to evaluate how many spots you have before you can say you have capacity. Great. Um, and sort of on the definitional front, a uh, question about uh, what is a micro home? So, so micro homes have different definitions. Uh, micro home generally just means a, a tiny home that uh, has you know a living area, uh, bathroom facilities, and kitchen. Um, it, definitionally, tiny home has a definition um, that generally says that the dwelling cannot be larger than 400 square feet and include a kitchen, bathroom, and sleeping living area. Um, but again, those definitions are uh, not always in code, but generally mean small home. Great. A um, couple questions left. So let, let us know if you have any additional questions by including them in the Q&A. Um, but uh, maybe just a question for anyone who wants to answer, where we, might we find data on the impact of each housing unit on city and county services? I would recommend talking to the departments which handle each of the, the services. They have information based on the each new household size and also different um, impacts on the household size the household each new household based on its size for example a school district has information on how many new students uh, a single family home would generate versus a multi-family home would generate and uh, the cost per student um, based on that your utility district will have understanding of what the new costs are um, for um, maybe not at every new unit but the cost for adding new lines for certain size units so um, I would talk to the departments and defer to others who have more experience. Nicole, it looks like you're on. Well, I had the same question and I don't want to put Adam on the spot, but um, I was, I think that's a comment we get from our city council is, so you're adding the footprint of a single family can be up to four units potentially and sold off. So how do you address that in your capital facility planning um, in terms of density in different locations of your city, especially if you don't know exactly what you're going to get, so. I, I can jump in really quickly. That is a really great question. I mean, I think what we're seeing in Kirkland, you know, three years after we adopted missing middle housing regulations and much more liberalized ADU regulations is that it's not like all of our single family zones are all of a sudden being developed all at once with this, these housing types. It's happening very incrementally. And that, that incremental approach, I think, allows our capital facilities plan to be sort of adjusted over time to keep up with that development. But yeah, there's not like this huge surge of development that we've seen um, so I think um, assuming that happens in other cities, it should be relatively reasonable for capital improvement plans to, to catch up, um, to keep up with that development. Okay, great. One last question, which I, I think um, great to have, I think Adam probably on cue for this, but as well as any anyone else. Um, so what if your local real estate market would result in it being very unlikely that low rise zone development would re result in affordable housing? So in other words, are we creating a windfall for market rate developers by upzoning areas to fit more units, which will be unaffordable? So any, anyone who wants to um, opine on that? that that's a million dollar question, right? But I think um, Generally speaking, right, smaller units are more affordable, right, and there are lots of exceptions out there in the world. Um, what we've seen too is that as units age, they become more affordable too. So, you know, a unit that sells for a million dollars right now might not be a million dollar unit in 20 or 30 years. So I think we're also building for the future, but I think really working on and focusing on getting the unit sizes smaller and smaller. Um, and eliminating parking requirements, things that artificially increase the cost of housing, I think. Um, will work towards the ultimate objective of more affordable housing, even in really expensive communities like Kirkland. Great. Um, any other any other thoughts on that? Well, I think it was well put. Um, I think that really covers it well. Um, we are nearing noon here, so um, I do wanna wrap things up. Um, so I'm just gonna share our final slide here. Um, here. 
Great. Um, so we really appreciate everyone joining us today um, for uh, this Passport 2044 session. Great, really great questions, really great presentations. Um, so uh, I just want to let you know that if you have any additional questions, um, please feel free to reach out um, to our email, planreview at psrc.org. We're happy to field questions later on. And of course, throughout the planning process, I know Commerce also has been answering a lot of questions and is happy to field more questions uh, in, into the future here too. Um, just wanted to launch our final poll question here. I think Maggie, do you have that queued up? Um, so our final question here is, Another sort of a feeling question of how you're feeling, whether you're feeling more confident, still have questions, um, still feeling overwhelmed, which is also perfectly understandable. So I um, just wanted to do kind of a temperature read of the room. Um, and also we welcome any additional feedback. So uh, we'll leave the little box up if you have any feedback um, in this moment in time, but um, we're also uh, continuing uh, to do a few more sessions uh, for the series into 2023. So certainly wanna make them as useful po as possible for local governments and uh, or and every, anyone else who wants to participate. So please feel free to let us know if you have any additional feedback on this session. Um, so we'll leave that up for a minute. Um, I will flag that uh, once the webinar closes, um, it should automatically launch this uh, Title VI survey. Um, it's uh, optional, but we do appreciate your participation to help us um, address our Title VI requirements. Um, so yeah, we really appreciate um, you and all of our uh, presenters here. Um, and we'll give it maybe just one more moment on filling out the box and uh, we'll then end the webinar here. Okay, thank you everyone, see you next time.